a professor from, uh, from uh, Haifa University, but I want to um, put it into a context that we already know about, which is that when the, when the human brain deals with quantity at all, there are at least two ways that the human brain can deal with it. One of them is literally counting, literally numerical. It's something that's, uh, let's say that for, for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, we'll hear about the archerfish later, but for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's not counting. It's, it's making a sudden categorical judgment. There's a pattern when you see one thing, two things, three things, maybe four things. It's a pattern that's related to George Miller's um, uh, uh, 1956 paper. Are you familiar with this, Tali? The num magical number seven plus or minus two? Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that estimate was wrong. It was pro probably more like three plus or minus one. But um, there are quantities, perceptual quantities that the human brain recognizes suddenly. Some people call it subitizing. Mm -hmm. sort of. And that's a way of perceiving quantity. Another way is to count. And, and we have a capacity to count. It's a, it's a, it's a iterative recursive uh, capacity. And then there's another way. And perhaps I'm, I'm kind of curious whether Tali uh, leans towards the very first, which is subitizing, the second, which is counting, or the third, which is just magnitude estimation. It's not really about numbers, it's about quantity. Uh, and with that, I open uh, the, uh, the, the floor to uh, Tali. Tali has kindly agreed to answer questions. I'll be watching the chat and I'll transfer the questions to Tali and she can decide whether she, she's ready to answer right away or she wants to defer it. Tali. Thank you. Um, so I'm really, really happy that due to COVID, I can uh, talk to you all without uh, traveling for 12 hours or more. So we're very happy to be here. Thank you, Stephen, for the invitation. Uh, I'm just going to send you a table that I think will help you um, during my uh, talk. And let me just share my screen. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about what do we process when we process magnitude. So Stephen, to answer your question, I do think that we can count and we can estimate, but it really depends on the circumstances and it's not as black and white and it, as it was previously suggested. And please free, feel free to jump in during the talk. So let's say that uh, this is Joy, and Joy is having really hard time studying math in school. And it's a shame because studies are showing that doing well in math in school can predict better physical health, mental health, better chances of finding a job uh, with higher pay, and better socioeconomical status. So in the large picture, my main goal is to find out how the brain learns math. So I can take an evidence-based approach for designing assessment tools to assess math learning difficulties and better ways of teaching math. Now this asterisk is telling, reminding me uh, and now you that I'm taking baby steps. So none of what I'm gonna show you today is something that can be applicable to schools right now, but this is definitely something that I keep in mind during uh, my uh, studies. So today I'm gonna give you some background about uh, one of the most debatable topics in uh, numerical cognition. Uh, do we process number, meaning the number of items in a set? Or do we process magnitudes, such as total surface area, density, and so on? Then I'm going to talk about magnitude integration, about combination of all available visual cues to provide an estimate. And then I'm going to dive in deeper into continuous uh, magnitudes uh, in between themselves. So let's start.
when uh, one of the basic questions is what are the building blocks of mathematics abilities? And when we want to study the building blocks, um, a popular way is a uh, study developmental studies, beginning with uh, newborns, even 72 hour old newborns and studies with animals. And a popular method with this kind of population is the non-symbolic number comparison task because it doesn't require any language or any form of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So here are some examples. This mouse, for example, needs to uh, respond uh, to press on the lever uh, um, X times according to the number of flashes of light this is. This is not number comparison, okay? This is just to show you that there are other methods as well. Birds are taught to discriminate and choose the, I, the group with the larger items. Fish are taught to swim towards where the more items are and so, so does chicks. So you see that this is number comparison is not the only method, but it's definitely a very popular one. And this kind of studies led to the ANS theory that stands for the approximate number system theory that focuses on the discrete property or the number of items in a set. And here are some outcomes of this uh, theory. Uh, this is from a model of Sage uh, Chinook and Dehane from 1983. And what you see here is the retinal output we see. They, according to their theory, we map the uh, special locations of each item, notice that we ignore the, the physical sizes, for example, and then it goes into a numerosity detector and we get an output. Now, the output is not always exact. It depends on the quantity. Because another thing is that um, the approximate number system or quantities no matter of what, it can be pitch of sound, it can be a number of uh, the size of objects, uh, brightness and so on. They are all mapped into this mental number line um, that is a logarithmic line. So the larger magnitudes are more uh, condensed and hence less discriminable, discriminable. So if for example, here you have 20, the output can be somewhere between, for example, 15 and 25. Another thing is that we have two separate core systems. Core system one to represent large numbers, and then performance is ratio dependent. Namely, if the ratio is uh, the smaller divided by the larger quantity, zero, 0 0.2, for example, can be 20 versus 100, 0 0.8 would be 80 versus 100. So performance um, is much more difficult as you get closer to one. It's ratio dependent only for large numbers, not for small numbers. Now, one of the reasons that the ANS is so um, popular is that it was found to be correlated with math abilities and even suggested that this is the basic ability that we need to study later math. So this is a study by Halberda et al. from 2008, highly citable paper, where he asked 14 year old participants to decide whether they see more blue or more yellow dots. And he changed the ratios between them and to see what is, what is the most subtle difference participants can still distinguish. And this is the Weber fraction. The lower it is, the better you are at discriminating smaller and smaller differences. And um, on the y-axis, you see the score in a calculation test. So you see this correlation. Uh, it's in, uh, important to note that other studies tried to replicate it. Not everyone succeeded. And those who did got a medium to a small size effect. However, there are several challenges to the ANS theory. First is the correlation problem. This is what you will uh, see 
a typical stimuli in the number comparison task. So you see that the number changes, but not only the number of dot changes, but the physical size too. You can't get into a situation where you have a different number of items, but all their continuous magnitudes stay the same. And when I'm talking about continuous magnitudes, I'll be talking about five, the density of the dots, the convex hull, which is if you connect all the dots in the periphery, what would be the area of the dots and the space between them, the total surface area of the dots, their total circumference, and their average diameter, if inside um, every group you have different size of dots. And usually this continuous magnitude in everyday life correlate with number. It means that, for example, the more apples I buy, the more uh, heavier they will be, the more space they will take in the drawer and so on compared to fewer apples. So if it's usually correlates with the environment, why do we ignore it? The second challenge is the computational demands or the adaptivity. Some studies have suggested that it's less demanding computationally to just compare the area, for example, than the number. And it can be very important. Think about it from a perspective of an animal. So say that this gerba needs to decide which uh, pieces of food to take, and he needs to do it very, very quickly because he's now outside exposed to predators. Would it be more adaptive to do a fast estimation maybe of the uh, height of the pile or the density instead of estimating the number because he needs to make a very quick decision? The uh, third challenge has to do with the different environmental demands. So maybe sometimes you do need to be very accurate and count and rely on number. For example, if you are baking a cake and you need exactly three or five or eight eggs, you want to be accurate. The same thing if you go on a field trip with 10 children, you want to go back exactly with 10 children, not something that looks about 10. However, if you need to decide which line to wait in, instead of counting the people, maybe you can just estimate where there are more by the line, by the length of the line that they make. Charlie, would you accept a question at this point? Of course. Uh, what role does the distinction between a relative and an absolute judgment play in what you're saying now? Magnitude estimation is relative. Whereas now you're talking about, when you're talking about exactness, you're talking about absolute judgments. Yes. So sometimes maybe uh, there is um, logic in being very precise, but sometimes it's not. And it, it doesn't um, yet clear what we do when we compare, for example, if you take uh, these two groups of dots. So some would say that we compare between them and then decide, while others would say, we estimate how many there are here, we estimate how many there are here, and then we compare them. And the comparison is a relative judgment. Is this more or is that more? And, the, and the, the how many there are, I don't know what it means, but when you say how many there are is an absolute judgment. It's basically asking to count. Uh, yes, but you can also ask uh, to estimate how many. And it's very, very interesting because if you're doing, for example, if you're asking people to, to place a quantity on a, on a line, you say, okay, imagine that the uh, leftmost point is zero and the uh, um, rightmost point is 10, where, you, where would you put uh, this quantity that I'm showing you for 100 milliseconds? So you need to estimate. At that, uh, in this task, People usually estimate, and when they estimate, um, they estimate smaller items to be more, and uh, larger items to be less. But in comparison tasks, you get the opposite. Like here, you assume that uh, the physically larger uh, dots will be more. 
So this is um, very nice because you see a distinction between uh, estimation, which is more absolute, and comparison that is more relative. Thank you. Okay. And there are also direct empirical evidence that support the role that continuous magnitudes have in a non-symbolic number comparison task. Uh, Kelly Mix and colleagues wrote a, a very nice paper in 2002 that review all the developmental studies that demonstrate uh, that the ability to perceive quantity is innate and explain it by continuous magnitudes because they weren't controlled, so they were a possible alternative explanation to the results. Now, <clears throat> uh, researchers are well aware of the correlation between continuous magnitudes and number, and this is why they're trying to break it in the experiment. So imagine that you are asked where there are more dots. And in 50% of the trials, you see the larger number of dots and the larger continuous magnitudes all in the same group. So these are positively correlated. There is a positive correlation between continuous magnitudes and number. But 50% 50, 50 of the trials will be incongruent. So the larger number would be in one group and the larger continuous magnitudes would be in another group. And this is a negative correlation. So if half of the trials are congruent and half are incongruent, in total, you don't have any correlation. And this is where uh, some researchers are saying that because uh, the continuous magnitudes are no longer a um, helpful cue of numerosity, they can't be used as a cue, as, as a clue to the right um, quantity, participants will just ignore them. And what we will measure is a pure number sense. But what happens when you separate congruent and incongruent trials? Then you get faster response times and higher accuracy rates for congruent and for incongruent trials. Now this gap in response time or performance is called the congruity effect. And this is the hallmark of automatic processing of the irrelevant dimension, the continuous magnitudes. So we can do this task, but we need to exert cognitive control to do that. So you don't only measure number sense, you also measure cognitive control. And there are very nice studies demonstrating it with fMRI or ERP that we do activate cognitive control in incongruent trials. Based on uh, this, uh, uh, such studies and many more, uh, my colleagues and I suggested the AMS theory, the approximate magnitude theory. I won't go into the entire model. I'll just tell you that it assumes that we are not able to discriminate quantities from the moment that we are born. What we do instead is to compare very crude continuous magnitudes then we learn the correlation that we talked about between a quantity or number and non-numerical magnitudes, continuous magnitudes. And with cognitive control, we are able to break this correlation and use it, uh, use continuous magnitude when it's appropriate and number when it's appropriate. Okay, so now after hopefully I convinced you that uh, continuous magnitudes matter, I want to move on and talk about magnitude integration. As I already said, there is a natural correlation between continuous magnitudes and number. Usually they positively correlate. So given this natural correlation between continuous magnitudes, I wanted to see whether there is a, an, a, an area in the brain, a network in the brain that can integrate these continuous magnitudes. This is a study I did in 2016 with Daniel and Sari. And um, it was an fMRI study. We typically developed adults and we had two, uh, two different uh, tasks. The quantity comparison task, 
we had four different levels of congruity. So if you remember before, I showed you that in congruent trials, all the uh, continuous magnitudes were positively correlated and in incongruent, they were all negatively correlated. So here we have different levels of congruity. In congruity level one, only one out of five continuous magnitudes is positively correlated with number. And in congruent level four, four out of five continuous magnitudes are positively correlated with number. Now the task here was to choose the a group with a larger amount of dots. You can say that congruity level four would be the easiest, right? Any questions, by the way? Okay. Next, we had a control task of brightness comparison. We wanted to have a type of magnitude to compare in a two first choice task. So here we ask which rectangle is darker and we wanted to match the difficulty. So the ratio of 0 0.4 between the luminances was as difficult as congruity level four and the ratios of 0 0.85 was as difficult as congruity level one. These are the fMRI uh, results that we got. So what you see here is the, an area that was working differently depending on the different task and the difficulty level. I hope you can see this yellow dot. It's the same dot, but you see it in different perspectives. So sagittal view, it's as if uh, you're looking at the brain from here, from different depth. Uh, corona as is if you're looking at it uh, from this perspective and transversal is from here. So it's the same spot from different point of views. And this area is the right inferior frontal gyrus. You see that its activity in the numerosity comparison task uh, decreased or increased when there are more clues, there are more continuous magnitudes to integrate. In difficulty level one, which was the easiest, you had four continuous magnitudes you can integrate with um, quantity. And this is when the activation was higher and it decreased until difficulty level four when you have only one continuous magnitude that you can integrate with number. Could it I ask right? another question? Yes. May I ask another question? What exactly was the instruction to the participants? What did, were they asked to do? They, they had to, they were asked to choose the a group containing the larger number of dots. So it really is, it's, it's strictly quantity and you're saying, you, and what you're inferring is what did they use to base their quantity judgment on? Exactly, exactly. Now that's, that's the problem with people, right? They always ask you for instruction. And this is, by the way, where the archer fish comes in. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that in the brightness task, what you see this slope is actually zero. So we see that when you have nothing to integrate, the activity stays the same and is not influenced by difficulty. So it's not only difficulty, it's the combination of quantities. Now, um, as, as I said, we need to ask people things. So we don't know what spontaneously they want. This is why we ask if we will use the same stimuli in, uh, be, as before that I just shown you with the four congruity levels, will an untrained animal spontaneously choose the group of dots according to its quantity, the continuous magnitudes, or the combination of all of these visual cues? So for that, we use the archer fish. So uh, the archer fish hunts uh, insects that live above the water level. It can sh hunt them by shooting a jet of water at them. And then they drop, it can predict where they're gonna drop and uh, eat. So uh, this was our animal model for several reasons. First, the hunting method. Second, and their brain structure. It's very, very simple. You can see optic tactum and telencephalon, not a lot more than that. Um, fish and humans diverged a long time ago uh, in evolution. So if you see something 
that is um, behaviorally similar for a fish and humans, it either means that it was preserved throughout evolution or was important enough to be developed independently in different species. Another thing is that these fish are highly trainable. We have them uh, in the lab and we can train them to shoot water, just like you saw in the video, but on a computer screen um, that's showing artificial targets that we present them. So it can be an asterisk or number or whatever we want. Um, and then you, can, you get the parallel of a person um, doing a forced choice task by clicking on the keyboard. Importantly for us, fish don't ask questions. We don't need to give them any instructions and we can know and we can uh, see if we don't train them and reward them regardless of their choice, we can see a spontaneous uh, preference. So, okay, but it, let me, still one can say, or you uh -huh. didn't give them instructions, they have a preference, but a preference for what? Exactly. This was our question, a preference for what? But here it's going to be, the answer to the question is going to be what task they thought they were doing. I, I don't know if they, they care about what task they are doing. Well, I mean, not, not for you, not for the experimenter, but when, but when they're in this situation and they have a choice, there's something that they're doing when they're making the choice. And the question is, what are they doing? Exactly. So these, these are the, the most neutral conditions that we were thinking about. Um, trying to, to somehow mimic what they have uh, in nature. So what, what are they doing in nature if they have uh, two different groups of insects standing on uh, different uh, foliage? What is guiding them then? Okay. So this is the general setup of a fish experiment. We have um, one fish per fish tank uh, with a computer screen above. It's rested on a glass, clear glass shelf, and it's hooked to a computer so we can present the stimuli. We record the experiment with fast video cameras that are synced, so we can extract response times if we want to. This is an example of one fish in the lab, you can see the jet of water. And uh, this is just an illustration of the stimuli. This is how the specific experiment that I'm telling you about went. So um, the fish saw uh, three flashes of uh, these boxes that were in either one of the corners of the screen indicating where the stimuli are going to appear. We never do it in the same spot because we don't want the fish to always uh, select one specific spot regardless of um, the stimuli. And then after a short blank screen, they have uh, they see these two groups of dots and they have 15 seconds to decide uh, which uh, group they're going to shoot water at. Once they do it, we give them a reward regardless of what they answer. And then they have 10, min 10 seconds to eat. We have time to clear the screen wipe the water and start the new, get ready for the new trial. We had seven fish, fish. each fish had 24 sessions of 48 trials each. Uh, when they saw the exactly the same stimuli with the four congruity levels I've shown you in the fMRI study. These are the results. So on the x-axis, you have the different congruity levels. You can see examples here. And on the y-axis, you have the chances, the proportion of selecting the group with the larger quantity, with the larger number of dots. And each colored line is a fish, and the black one is the mean of all the fish. 50% is chance level. So what you can see is that for congruity levels one, two, and three, the fish preferred the a group containing less dots and more and larger continuous magnitudes. But in congruity level four, it switched. So uh, they preferred the uh, group with the larger quantity 
and larger continuous magnitudes. Now in congruity level three and two, for example, we had different two continuous magnitudes that were positively correlated with number. And we tried to see if there are differences and they weren't any. So it's not the specific continuous magnitude that made a response, but rather the number of continuous magnitudes correlated with number. Okay. So moving on. Um, so far we talked, yeah. Sally, just a, a comment. Is that the end of the archer fish story? Uh, for that one, yes. But if you okay. want, I can. No, say no, no, that no. no. About... I, I don't. I was afraid for a moment when you showed the archer fish brain that you were going, oh, to, no. hurt, that going to hurt them. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, what we do is strictly behavioral. Okay. And they ahead. actually enjoy it. Sometimes you see we need to cover the aquariums um, to the sides because. They, they try to, to answer it when it's they, not their turn. Archer fish are little geniuses. There are many, many they, people are interested in, in archer fish cognition. They, they are, and I think they are a great animal model. The, the only restriction is that we get them, they, they can be uh, raised in the lab. So they, we, we get them from uh, importers and we don't know whether they are male or males or females. We don't know how old they are. We don't know if they're sick or not. Um, and, yeah. and so we have all these unknowns that we're dealing with. And I really, really hope that someone will be able to breed them in a lab. And then I think it will be the new, the new zebra fish. What did the biologists say about why they, it's so difficult to breed them in the lab? Apparently, well, my husband can tell you more about it, he's a biologist. Apparently, uh, many, many animals have very, very specific uh, times when they breed or very specific condition. It can be the length of the day or funny things like flamingos, for example, apparently need mirrors huh. to appropriate. <laughs> Um, so I, I think that it's a, it's a, and, and if you don't know which uh, fish is male and which fish is female, or if, if they're constantly male or female, how do you know who to put with whom? It's <laughs> so it true. Is very, yeah. It's, it's true. I mean, statistically, in the end, you should be able to approximate it, even if you don't know what the gender is, but yeah. yeah I, okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, so far we saw that the set of items can be characterized by either the quantity, the number of items in a set or continuous magnitude. Until up to about two decades ago, the focus was on quantity, the non-symbolic number in recent decades. Uh, now the, the, the role of continuous magnitude is acknowledged and studied more, but we still see them as a group, as continuous magnitudes. Um, but they're made up of different uh, things like density, total surface area, etc. So what happens if we study them individually? This is a, a study led by uh, Mazal Ezra, one of my uh, master's students. And uh, what we asked in this study are two questions. First, in a cognitive magnitude comparison task, just like the one I showed you with the dots, but this time we ask about continuous magnitudes. We wanted to see whether participants can selectively attend to a specific continuous magnitude according to our task instructions. So they can, can they focus on just the total surface area or just the convex half and how it will affect performance. And the second question is under which conditions quantity will be processed automatically and what would characterize this automatic processing? And I want to take a moment to focus on this question and explain its significance. I've shown you before the congruity effect and we talked about how this is the hallmark of automatic processing. But sometimes the congruity effect can be broken down into two components. To do that, you need a neutral condition. So imagine that you see these two groups of dots, but you are asked about 
the total surface area, where you see a larger total surface area. In that condition, in this question, you can have a neutral condition when you keep the number of dots equal and only change the continuous magnitude. And then you see the, this pattern of response times, usually congruent is the fastest, and incongruent is the slowest, the neutral is somewhere in the middle. So facilitation is the time difference between neutral and congruent. And it tells you how much having another clue going in the same direction as the correct answer facilitated help the performance. On the other hand, you have interference by how much having um, a confusing dimension, anti-correlated one that goes against the right answer, hinder your performance. And these congruent components are not often studied in non-symbolic stimuli, but when we do study them in symbolic stimuli, we see very interesting things. This is an example for a study by uh, Oli Rubinstein and Avishai Hennig from 2005. They asked adults, uh, typically developed adults or adults with developmental dyscalculia, which is a learning difficulty specific to math, to say which number is physically larger. So here in congruent trials, this will be the five. It's congruent because five is numerically and physically larger. In neutral, you only play with the relevant dimension. And in incongruent, five is the correct response, but it's numerically uh, larger and physically smaller. And this is why it's incongruent. And they check facilitation and interference. So you can see that in typically developed adults, you have both interference and facilitation. But in participants with developmental dyscalculia, there was only interference and no facilitation. Now, according to Posner, facilitation is a sign of automatic processing of the irrelevant dimension, that you see that it really helps your performance. And people with developmental dyscalculia don't enjoy it. By the way, this is also the typical pattern you see in typically developed seven-year-olds. And interference is a sign of more attentional processing. So it can show you how separating the congruity components can shed more light on, on the different processes uh, that's going on. Back to our study. We had three groups of participants. Um, one, of, one group was asked about uh, where the average diameter of the dots is different because the dots were in different physical sizes in each group. One group was asked about the convex hull and one group was asked about the uh, total surface area. So average diameter stand, AD stands for average diameter, CH for convex cell, and TS for total surface. We also manipulated uh, the stimuli. So largely we had congruent, incongruent, and neutral trials. Okay, congruent, all the continuous magnitudes were positively correlated with number, incongruent, all the continuous magnitudes were negatively correlated with number. And in neutral, we had exactly the same number. The groups contained between 10 and 40 dots, and the ratio between the number of dots range between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. I'll be getting to why very soon. Um, and we manipulated the stimuli differently. How? In the average diameter condition, the ratio between the average diameter was identical to the ratio between the quantities between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. In the convex cell condition, the ratio between the convex cells was between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. And in the total surface area, the total surface area uh, was a range between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Why it's important? First, these are the results. This is the table I sent you. And you want me to send it again because 
people right here. We, we, we have it. We have it in the, the uh, messages, so it's it's um, there. I was able to open it, and anybody can open it. I think from the okay. But so it's sometimes people that join late can see the chats from before. So I just joined. Okay, I just yeah, yeah, attached yeah. it again. Okay. So what you see here is uh, the different manipulations we did and how uh, the ratios between the total surface, the average diameter, and the convex cells were affected. And in the average diameter manipulation, you can see that the average diameter range between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. And in the, other in, in the other things we can't control, so we just recorded them. You can see that in the total surface area, the differences were huge. Point, uh, a difference of 0.2 is very distinguishable, very hard, difficult to miss. But if you take a look at the convex hull condition, it's more difficult. You see there are things that, are, that there are stimuli that are 0 0.99 similar, which is very, very, very subtle difference. Okay, and you can see that the convex hull here was between 0.4 and 0.6, and the total surface here was between 0.4 and 0.6. Keep this in mind when we're gonna look at the results. Now, why uh, different saliences are so important to us? Let's demonstrate with um, an experiment that uh, uses numeric, uh, symbolic numbers. If I'm asking you which number is larger in value, here it's six, it's very easy. Here it's also six. Here it was easier than here. Why? So in 2013, my colleagues and I um, had this experiment when we showed these um, pairs of numbers, um, si uh, single digit numbers, and we manipulated the numerical ratios. We had eight different numerical ratios and eight different physical ratios, congruent and incongruent, ratios, so it was eight by eight by two number of conditions. And we wanted to see how uh, the size of the, uh, the ratio of the relevant and the irrelevant dimension affects the congruity effect. So you see here that numerical ratio was the relevant dimension. This is what I asked about. And the physical dim uh, ratio was the irrelevant dimension. Now, if you look at the difficulty in the numerical ratio, the relevant one, the difficulty increased uh, with the increase of ratio. So here, instead of two to six, if we had to compare eight and nine, it would be much more difficult. But what happens in the irrelevant dimension? It's exactly the opposite. So here, the most difficult condition was when the physical ratio was closer to zero. Why? Because then the difference is very obvious and it's really difficult to ignore such an obvious effect. So this is why sometimes you can get a very high congruity effect, and sometimes you can get no congruity effect at all. To summarize, we understand now that the congruity effect is affected by both the saliency of the relevant and the irrelevant dimension. And in the current work, to simplify, we kept the ratio between the quantities that is the irrelevant dimension constant between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Why? Because we know from previous studies that uh, this ratio is salient enough to be processed even when it's not relevant to the task and we wanted to check congruity effects. This is how a typical trial looked like, a blank screen, a fixation in the center of the screen and after a while, a group, of dots appear and you have three seconds to decide according to the task instructions you got which of uh, the two groups of dots you select. So the question type was different from different participants, but um, all the participants, so all the manipulation and every manipulation including all three congruity conditions. Um, so these are the results. First, we wanted to see if participants are able to focus on one relevant continuous magnitude. So what you see here is a different plot for every question. So this was the average diameter question, the convex hull question, and the total surface area question. 
On the uh, y-axis, you see the accuracy. 0 0.5 is chance level. This is the red line. And uh, the third triplet is the average diameter manipulation followed by the convex hull manipulation and the total surface manipulation in congruent neutron and incongruent tracks. So if you take a general look, you see that performance was usually above chance level. Perform accuracy was very high, except for here, when most participants were at chance level. And why is that? To do that, we need to take a look at uh, the table I've just shown you. Remember that in incongruent trials, the ratio between the convex hull, which is the continuous magnitude that participants were able to focus on, it was hardly distinguishable. And this is why they just had to guess. But in the neutral and in the congruent trials, when number was not there to confuse them, they performed fairly well. Now, notice that here they saw exactly the same stimuli, but they had to attend to the total surface area and here to the average diameter. So it's not like they couldn't avoid the convex sum, but they chose to focus on it when it was the relevant dimension to the task. So even though all of the dimensions I told you about total surface area and um, average diameter and convex cell are all correlated, we are still able to extract one of them and focus on it. Second thing we saw is that the question type itself influences efficiency. Um, efficiency is a response time divided by accuracy. The lower it is, the more efficient you are. So um, what you see here is the different manipulation. So all the average diameters are exactly the same stimuli participants saw, but under different uh, question types, under different instructions. And you see how these instructions affected uh, their efficiency. This blue bar here is the convex hull when it was hardly distinguishable. And this is why you see um, that the efficiency was really, really poor. And you can see it, it, it affected differently the different conditions. The second question was about the congruity uh, components. So facilitation, the time difference between neutral and congruent condition and interference, the time difference between, or efficiency difference between uh, incongruent and neutral trials. And for every manipulation, every, every question type or instruction type, we wanted to see whether facilitation and interference uh, existed, whether they were uh, significantly different than zero. These are the p-values. So you see that uh, in uh, the average diameter manipulation, we always have facilitation and interference. In the total surface manipulation, we had only interference. And in the convex cell, it depended. Now we wanted to see whether uh, these facilitations that are all significant are different in size. And the same goes for uh, these uh, facilitation and these interferences. So this is the next plot I'm going to show you. As you can see here, uh, the facilitation was indeed different in size, pending on the different questions that we ask participants, different thing, continuous dimension we ask them to attend to. And the same goes for interference. Another thing we wanted to see is whether facilitation and interference are different in size from one another. Because again, facilitation and interference indicate different things. So this is what we see here for every question type. Uh, the facilitation and the interference, we see that we always have larger effect for interference than for facilitation. Now, according to Posner, I remind you that facilitation is the hallmark of automatic processing while interference is um, the hallmark of attentional processing. So here, it seems that we have more attentional processing of number than automatic processing. So just to conclude uh, this study, adult participants are indeed 
able to focus their attention on a single continuous magnitude. The saliency of the relevant dimension affected the processing of magnitudes. And this finding supports the approximate magnitude system theory, suggesting that the saliency of quantities and other magnitudes depends on top-down factors, such as the task instructions, and bottom-up factors, such as the saliency of the different magnitudes. This might be a good point for a pause before yeah. you do your final take home message. There was a question earlier after the archer fish uh, uh, from, uh, from, um, from Nua Atlas. The question mm -hmm. is, have you done it on two questions actually? Have you done it on other organisms? For example, uh, sh she mentioned um, uh, uh, mammals like dogs. And the second thing is about training. I mean, uh, and this is true about this question is valid both for animals and for humans. I should say for human animals and non-human animals. Uh, you tell them to pay attention to a dimension, but what about training? Yes. Um, so whether it was done on the other um, animals, um, spontaneous discrimination, yes, uh, it has been done. And, and you see that when uh, there was actually a, a group that in 2012 did uh, this uh, a similar study with um, angelfish. They wanted to see which, uh, this, which plate of food they will choose. And in 2012, they didn't control continuous magnitudes and then they decided its quantity. In 2020, they repeated the experiment, but this time they control um, the size of the food and they saw that um, it's, uh, it's influencing uh, the decision-making. Uh, and there was even a condition when they uh, had the different number of items, but uh, their physical size was the same and then uh, performance was not chance level. Um, so yes, it happens with, uh, with other animals too. Uh, once you can control now, not all the time we can get these uh, very accurate results like we see here because the artificial allow us to do um, many repeats and get very, uh, uh, very good results, very good data. Uh, and for example, with bees, you can only do a single trial or something like that. Um, so that answers the comparative uh, question, but what about the question about influence of training? And by training, what's meant not just uh, the training of the archer fish that they get that they get uh, rewards after, etc. But what if you what if the rewards were favoring one dimension over another? Yes. Yeah, so this is the, a study that we are planning to to do, um, but um, there are studies with uh, different uh, sorts of fish, different kinds of fish. They do show that you can train them to, to use um, symbolic mag uh, numerical magnitudes, but it's easier to train them to, to discriminate between continuous magnitudes. Fine. So let, another species is human. What about training in humans? Yeah. So, so humans, you can, you know, you can tell people to select the, the larger, the smallest number or the largest number, but you don't know exactly if this is what they're going to go by. Because as I said, it's very difficult to control the influence of other continuous magnitudes. So some will try to, to get cute and say, okay, so I will always select the, the smallest magnitude, for example. Uh, or something like that. So in humans, you, you don't need to train, you just give instructions. Yeah, can, instructions is one thing, and then you find out spontaneously what they do when you tell them to pay attention to this or pay attention to that. But training is another question. I mean- uh, Training to do what? You could, you could favor some, uh, some aspects. It doesn't even have to be particularly one. You could, you could favor ratios and things like that and see how in the same way that you're that you're interested in how much how many more mistakes they make under this condition or those conditions you can also find out if you've been favoring something what does it do to the overall effect in, in yeah, what's behind this is of course this is a cognitive informatics uh, seminar and we're going to be interested although you don't do it we're going to be interested in models for this um, the underlying process including learning 
So uh, one thing I, I can say about it is um, I know about, I, I really don't know enough about, for example, computational modeling, but there is one study I know of, it, it was done by someone who was with me during the PhD, Gali Katz, she was from computer sciences, and she uh, tried to tackle this question of continuous magnitudes and quantities um, by using uh, evolutionary algorithms. So what she did is she trained one algorithm first to discriminate between continuous magnitudes and then discriminate between quantities and compared it to an algorithm she trained right away to discriminate between continuous, between um, quantities, between numbers. And she saw that the uh, learning of discrimination between numbers for the algorithm that was first taught to discriminate between continuous magnitudes was much um, shorter and efficient than the algorithm that only learned from scratch to discriminate between uh, quantities, if, if that answers your question. Well, it would be nice to know what that implies. Uh, you know, one of the interests in, in cognitive informatics is in producing um, software that will help children learn math, okay? And for that sort of thing, it's good to know what their starting point is, uh, what, uh, what, 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 where, what their biases are, and what scope there is for changing them with various kinds of schedules. So one thing that I really wanted to do um, is, is to build, I, I didn't call it a software, but a, a training, but it's, it's the same, I think. It, it will be even nicer with the software, uh, is to try and train, I, I'll start earlier. So uh, remember that at the beginning, I showed that there is, they think that there is a correlation between how uh, well you're able to differentiate between quantities and how good you are in calculations. So there are many studies that are trying to train the ANS to, to try and, and, you know, by just by giving feedback and make participants better at this perception. And they are getting better, but it doesn't affect uh, mathematics. What, what do you mean? It means that they, they, uh, their performance in the number acuity task gets better. They can discriminate between finer and finer differences, but it doesn't affect their math abilities. It doesn't- Oh, I see, I see, your, I see. Yeah, and this is in uh, children of what age? Uh, it's, it's been done uh, in, uh, in different ages. I think that usually elementary schools. So you think that the underlying uh, ability is pretty rigid and not not uh, not uh, plastic no i think that uh, there is there is something called the symbol grounding problem we still don't know um, where our uh, symbolic understanding of number is coming from one theory is that we first learn these non symbolic quantities and then we map the symbols we match the symbols with the um, quantity uh, but sometimes it doesn't make sense because you see, uh, for example, that four-year-olds are better in comparing symbolic numbers than non-symbolic numbers. So how can they be these spaces if, if, they're, uh, if, if they are less proficient in that? Uh, sometimes you see that when children improve, in uh, discriminating between symbolic numbers, saying which one is larger, the symbol four or the symbol six, numerically, then they become better in comparing quantities. So we are not sure that these two are related. One thing that we do find, this is a, a study of uh, Bogdan and Ansari from 2015, they have been, done this uh, number, non symbolic number comparison task with congruent and incongruent trials um, on uh, elementary school children with and without dyscalculia, uh, learning difficulty in math. And they've shown that it's only in the incongruent condition that children with dyscalculia are different from children 
without this cochlea. So maybe it's not a problem of perception of quantity at all. Maybe it's a problem of um, inhibitory control, of inhibiting the, the effect of the continuous magnitudes. Maybe it, uh, it's a problem, and this is what I think of understanding the first, the initial understanding of the correlation between number and continuous magnitudes, and then the ability to break it. And this is where my studies are going. So I want to see um, whether participants, for example, children uh, with better facilitation abilities are better in math. And then whether if we will train facilitation, we will see any improvement in math abilities. So I'm not sure that uh, the, the non-symbolic quant quantity system is the, the basis for the symbolic system we see. Maybe it just develops independently. Okay, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, do your conclusions now. It's not, it shouldn't be a surprise to you that the, that the uh, symbol grounding problem is one of the themes of this entire series of seminars. That's good. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, please, Tal. Okay. So we saw that since uh, discrete number and continuous magnitudes all affect performance, we should never assume that we can control their influence and we should always study their possible influence, even it's, if it's not um, the goal of the study. We saw that it's also important to study continuous magnitudes, not only as a group, but as separate magnitudes. Now, it's been done, for example, in perception. There are many studies about a perception of density, for example. And it can add more knowledge to what we know. A a Camilla Gilmore, for example, has nice studies about how convex hull can affect a performance differently in different stages of development. And it can also just being aware of these different, the differences between different continuous magnitudes can help to reduce the noise in the data. Because usually when we talk about continuous magnitude as a whole, we try to give very vague instructions, like where you see more a uh, yellow area, if your uh, dots are yellow. And then we, we take the chance that each participant is uh, attending to a different dimension. I once asked participants, uh, after a, a task that was meant to focus on number according to what they decided. And some told me total surface area and some density, and some even uh, gave me this formula that they think that they used. So if different continuous magnitudes have different saliency, we can get uh, very noisy results. Um, another question is whether different saliency uh, of different mag can the saliency of different magnitudes can change across development uh, or can be different in this calculia. And as I told you before, computation models uh, can provide important insights in this field. So that's it. I'll be very happy to answer questions. Maybe you could unshare and then we can have general questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so the questions are open to everybody and you can pose the question in French and we can translate it. So questions in both languages are welcome. Um, go ahead. If not, I, I always have a few more before. I, I won't let Tali get away without some more questions. I just want to say that I did a small experiment with my dog and uh, I can just uh, share with you the, the link to the YouTube, the little YouTube video I did about it uh, okay. to explain about the ANS versus the AMS theories. Uh, but, but you can go ahead and ask okay. Meanwhile, let me let me set it off by asking, could everybody, of course, will be thinking about two authors, anybody who's thought about this problem that will be thinking about two authors who, who uh, and two researchers who are behind it all. What is in a in a more Alan Alda um, plain sense, 
uh, what is the relation of your findings to uh, the original findings of Piaget about conservation? Oh, it's everybody, very, asks, very... everybody asks you that question, but you have to still make it explicit. I, I, I love this question because I th if, if I'll go back to, uh, can I share again? Yes. Okay. Um, if I go back to the model I suggested, There we go. Um, so I'm talking about first uh, over applying the correlation between um, number and non-numerical magnitude. And this is very similar to what we see in Piaget's number conservation task. In this task, uh, do, do you know, do you all know it or should I explain? Very Let briefly? me suggest that you should do an Alan Alda approach now to everybody. Okay. There's a large proportion of people whose main competence is in, uh, is in computer science and not okay. in uh, cognitive psychology. Great. Um, so let's, let's do this uh, live. Let me improvise in the spirit of Elenada. Okay, so let's say we have a, this is what a child sees, okay? two rows of coins. And the experimenter asks him, does this row has more coins? Does this row has more coins? Or do this, are they the same? And uh, I'm talking about uh, kids before the age of five. So some of them will even count and will say the same. And then right in front of the uh, child, the experimenter space out um, one of the rows and then repeats the question. And then without even uh, thinking, the child would say, can you guess? This row has more borders. Yeah. Why? Because it's bigger. And uh, this is an example of over applying the correlation because here technically you can have more coins and they take more space and usually if you had more coins, they would take more space. And this is uh, what happens when you first learn the correlation. Later, when you develop inhibition abilities, you know when it's appropriate to use it and when you need to ignore it. Now, um, I know that this, um, this task is uh, very uh, debatable because, for example, if you do it with M&Ms, instead of coins, children know exactly how many even when you space it out. So it can be dependent on the way PSGS, the questions or the stimuli used. Um, but uh, LaRoche and his group in 2009 uh, did a similar study with adults in fMRI. And of course, adults knew exactly the question, but they activated more areas of cognitive control under this what I would call an incongruent condition. So does this answer your question? Yes. Uh, and, and are the, are the pre-conservation children like the archer fish or, or, or are the archer fish more like the post-conservation? Mm, I don't know because I didn't ask the archer fish if it prefers numbers. Uh, this is actually on the plan. But what I can tell you about the archer fish is that uh, I've tried to teach it symbolic numbers, the order of symbolic numbers. So his stimuli was the symbolic numbers one through four. Um, and I tried to, to actually train it, uh, for example, to, to shoot water at the larger uh, number. And uh, between one and four, it worked after a lot of training. Um, when, I sh when I'm uh, showing the fish in the training phase only consecutive um, numbers, so one, two, two, three, three, and four, uh, it performed above chance level. And in the test phase, um, again, I'm showing uh, non only non-consecutive um, non consecutive pairs like one, three, two, and four, and uh, the performance was again above chance level. 
And it also had a size congruity effect, like you saw with the three and the five that were different in sizes. But uh, when I was trying to repeat the study with five digits, I saw that he wasn't able, they, they weren't able to, to learn uh, anything above chance level. So what I saw was probably an end effect. They learned the, the edges, the end cores, mm -hmm. but not the middle. So um, I, I don't know if a fish has transitivity, which according to Piaget is very, very um, basic and required for these jumps in cognitive abilities. Thank you very much. Could you do the same thing, but this time not with Piaget? Uh, with Piaget, you, you were reasonable to it was reasonable to assume that everybody here knows what Piaget says or, 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 or understands. Another writer in this area that you're familiar with is, is Galistel, and I wanted to know how your work uh, bears on his, but for that, could you please also give everybody an idea of what Galistel says? Uh, so you're talking about the numerosity detector? Yeah. And, and his book, and he has a whole book on this, so, so yeah. Okay, so, so what he is uh, basically saying, um, if, if I understand you correctly, is that um, we, we are representing numbers analogically, but uh, it's noisy. So he's comparing that to pouring uh, a water into a beaker. And uh, if you're pouring a, a lot of water, then it takes the, the, the water a while to, to set on the, the right scale. And this is when you don't exactly know what the quality is. So I think Galistel talks more about estimation and, and I don't know how much of his studies um, are um, concerning the, the role of continuous magnitude and comparisons. But correctly, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Well, he introduces his his notion is that at low ends of the quantitative continuum, it's another process. Continuous magnitudes mm -hmm. only happen when you exceed the threshold for the other for the. And I would say that although it's not exactly correct, but the lower end process is an absolute one. You can train right. archer fish, etc to to uh, to literally to make an arbitrary response for when there's one thing, two thing, three things, four things. And so they, and they can Yeah, we actually on. did it. Yeah, you did. Okay. So so that's that is uh, an absolute task. You're basically saying if you if you give a if you give a relative task but where but where you have a participant who can count, then obviously they're going to they're going to count both of them and and the higher count gets the but above a certain value, according to Galistel, that's not possible. And you have no choice but to go into things like convex hull and whatever uh, is affecting your, your magnitude uh, um, perception. This, this is what Galistel is saying. Yeah. But uh, um, the, I forgot the names of the other things. This is the core system one, core system two theory uh, from 2004 they're actually saying the opposite. So they're saying that um, in larger quantities, we don't use continuous magnitudes, but in smaller quantities and until four, we do use them. With, the, with what you said about logarithmic, I mean, basically psychophysics says that, uh, how, how can that be? I mean, you, you get- Yeah, you know, I know. Fuzzy. So, you know, according to studies they did, they, they, they demonstrated, they show an influence of continuous magnitudes only in the lower range. But, you know, it can be a methodological issue because as, as you say, if, if I'm thinking about it computationally, it's very easy, it's a pattern recognition almost. Although there are arguments about this, for example, about, um, what comes first, the ability to subitize, to make a very fast and uh, accurate estimation of the quantity uh, that we see, or is it just a perfection of um, counting? Now, it's, it's a chicken and it sounds like a chicken and an egg problem, 
and um, because you in 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 these kinds of tasks you need participants to say aloud how many items they see and you can't do it with pre-verbal children um, but something that I am uh, trying to do and the, because of COVID I can't do these experiments now because they uh, require the use of eye movements and uh, some studies have demonstrated that you do less eye movements in the subitizing range um, and, and you can see by according to eye movement when participants start to count. So this can be nice because then um, you don't have to, you, you don't need the participants to say anything. You can just uh, let them see something and use an eye tracker uh, to see that. So, um, and in addition, my colleagues and I developed an algorithm that can estimate the individual subitizing range of every participant, which is something that was always done uh, at the group level by then, or in a method that did a gross overestimation and were not accurate. So what we're thinking about doing is try and see if we can measure the subitizing range only with eye movements, and then try to start and, and measure subitizing in uh, starting with nine month old infants to see whether subitizing comes before or after counting. It makes sense to think of, uh, well, that's a good question, and I, but it makes sense to think that, uh, that uh, eye movements would be a cue to the fact that you're not, well, in, in subitizing, it's subitizing, it's sudden. You look at the whole pattern and you see there's three, there's two, there's four, there's one. Although, although some people will argue that you do count, but you do it really, really quick and really efficient because the slope is never zero. Okay, so let's, yes, but, but uh, that still fits with what you said, which is that yes. very little eye movement when you're subitizing and it's more once you're counting. But according to Galistel, there's three, right? There's, there's subitizing, yeah. there's counting, counting and some have, and then there's just plain continuous magnitude estimation. Yes, I think, I think it's, uh, it's more um, task and context dependent than we think. Because even in my experiments, in my enumeration experiments, you can see uh, how flexible this range is. So um, some people will start guessing from seven and some people will take the time and count even until nine and 10. And I think it's, it, it will change if you change, for example, their motivation, if you give money rewards for how accurate they are, uh, of how long you give people a uh, time to view the experiment, the, the stimuli, uh, whether they can use additional strategies such as groupitizing, which is when you take small groups, um, divide them and see and do like, if you, and you can subitize within the groups and then add them up. Uh, so I think that it's, it's more complicated than something static. I think it does exist. But again, if you, if you need to make a split second decision, even if you have like only 20 or 30 dots, you may have to use continuous magnitudes. Or maybe you don't need to go into the estimation of number. So it's really task dependent and saliency dependent. Of course, that if the numerical ratio is what's obvious, you will notice this. Uh, the numerical ratio, but uh, if the total surface area is the is the largest one, uh, and it's a better cue, why not use it? Independently okay. of the range. If there's no other questions, I have one last question. If you're not exhausted. No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, I mean, we have geometry and we have algebra and we have uh, arithmetic. Uh, yeah. I have a feeling in geometry, I'm sure that that uh, parallel processing and vision plays a role. But in in uh, in in arithmetic, it's much more likely to be serial. And the first question is, have you looked at um, at uh, temporal numerosity rather than spatial numerosity judgments? Uh, um, 
I want to do, but uh, this is, um, it's very difficult because then you don't know what they remember, um, whether they remember, for example, the, the total, the surface area or the, the convex cell and how exactly you control these continuous magnitudes uh, in time. Well, it's surely it's one dimensional, but it's, but it's the same sort of thing. You did it with your dots, right? With the, it's it's by the frequency and the and the distance and the interval between. So what? So exactly? Uh, so maybe I misunderstood you. Can can you repeat the instead question? Of, and what do you mean of temporal? You you can if you if we do your kind of experiment where the yeah. where this participant whether it's an archer fish or a child or a human says which is more and they have to choose between two, and the sequence is temporal. Da da. Uh, you really present them. Yeah. Then, then you have uh, the the same number because if the same problem of a confound of a confound because uh, and it was done a lot with uh, children. If you want to show more dots and fewer dots in the same uh, sequence of time in the same length of time, uh, then you have to show more dots faster, uh, and this can be a cue. Um, so it, it was done uh, a lot developmentally, uh, also uh, across model studies. Uh, when you see a, a, two, a video of, of a doll beats twice on a drum, but you hear three drum beats, and uh, they see if uh, the looking time is different than when you see two and hear two drum beats. Uh, but they all suffer from, from the same uh, confounds. And, and that's, the, that's the main issue. Yeah, the, the, but the time domain is such that you can, you can manipulate the, the, length, the length of the interval, the absolute length. You can manipulate the length of the sound. And, uh, and of course, th that there's an interaction there. If you manipulate the length yeah. of the sound and the interval, you have to have uh, something has to give. Anyway, yeah. With that, I want to thank you very much, Tali. I, I, I'm sorry that the interaction was mostly with me. Usually there's more uh, questions from others. Well, maybe I should take a pause. Est-ce qu'il y en a qui sont gênés, qui auraient une question à poser? Are there, is there anyone that was inhibited but has questions to ask? Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, so this is related to training, actually. I was just wondering how much practice your participants are given in that sort of final big experiment with four different dimensions going on? Um, you mean the training that we do before the, the study to see whether they got the results? We well, got, the, got the instructions right, sorry? Yeah, so is there any period where the people can sort of practice the task and figure out how it works before okay. you start recording their data? Yes. Uh, what we did in the uh, last study that I've shown in, in with the three different instructions um, is we gave a practice um, and uh, started the experiment when participants answered a trend, 10, um, 10 trials correctly in a row. And we limited the number of trials to 90, but no one reached uh, that sort of, um, that, 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 uh, that limit. So usually uh, it's done pretty quickly, as long as they understood, uh, for example, what the total area is or what convex hull is, uh, they're able to do it very quickly and accurately. Okay, and are, is the practice at a easy difficulty level or is it kind of... Uh... It's random. It's random, we, okay. We take okay. Uh, random uh, trials from the experiment for each participant. Okay, now Alberto Testolin, who is in this series, uh, he'll be speaking later. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tali, first of all, for the very nice talk. Uh, I'm well aware of your work because I work with uh, Marco Zorzi oh. in computational modeling of this kind of processes. Yeah. And I really like uh, your approach. So I, I just wanted to jump in because I saw that uh, Stefan is, was very interested in this temporal estimation problem for numerosity. And I, I just want to say that I can include a few slides later in my talk about this because we are tackling this problem, actually. We are 
thinking about how to do that. Also mm-hmm. taking into account, of course, the continuous magnitudes, like frequency, individual length of the event, interval length, uh, tempo, <laughs> rhythm. It's messy, <laughs> but we are <laughs> trying to use a, a recently proposed uh, stimulus space by the group of The Wind uh, and Elizabeth <sighs> Brano. Which is trying. Don't to... get me started. <laughs> no, yeah, that's why I, I will just maybe include a few slides in my okay. talk, and then we can discuss if Tali will join us. Yes, Tali, you're welcome. As you know, to all of these, I hope you come back. I, I'll be happy to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Are there other questions from inhibited people? Is there another question? Si no. I want to thank, if not, then I want to thank Tali very much for her very stimulating talk. And next week, next time.